Okay. Hi. Hello. I have to get something out of the way right at the top. Not this golem. This ain't an essay about Smeagol. You can still make your my precious jokes in the comments. They're all very funny and good for engagement, but we're not talking about Middle Earth here. Thank you. Now, the golem spelled like that is, well, it's a Jewish thing. Do you know that? To some of you, that'll be very obvious. To others, it might be the first you're hearing of it. The golem is a piece of Jewish folklore. In some ways, it is a very specific myth. In others, it's quite loose. And now, in the 21st century, it's kind of everywhere. And all of this, the origin, its interpretations, its modern permutations, ties into what makes it such a fascinating cultural object. But I think we need to make sure we've all got like a base level of knowledge here. The Golem, as with many Jewish stories, is something I heard about as a kid. I probably got pieces of it as a bedtime story at some point, or maybe, maybe part of a joke, but I know the first complete telling of it I heard was from this book, Daniel Wisniewski's Golem. And yes, this is a kid's book. It has big pictures, but I want to give you the same introduction I had to this myth. And also, I think this book is good as hell. So take a seat, class. It's story time. Okay, Daniel Wisniewski's Gollum, written and illustrated by the man himself. Published in 1996, marked discard. Oops, we will not be doing that. Before we start, one thing I want to point out is that this book uses cut paper illustrations, which is a style I've really never seen used in a book like this, and it makes it just unbelievably striking. It's probably the reason I have such vivid memories after so many years. Don't worry, I'll make sure everyone gets a chance to see the pictures. So. We open in Prague in 1580. As we'll get to later, Prague in 1580 is not the first incidence of the idea of a golem, but it is where virtually everyone puts the big golem story. The first line of the book is, within the beautiful city of Prague, fierce hatreds have raged for a thousand years. Prague then was a city with a sizable Jewish population and a Jewish quarter, including, as Wisniewski writes here, a walled ghetto. We're still on the first page when he says one of the most important parts of the story here. The Jews of Prague were bearing the ignorant fury of others. Enemies had accused them of mixing the blood of Christian children with the flour and water of matzah. He calls this the blood lie. It's also frequently referred to as blood libel. It's basically the myth that Jews would kidnap and ritually sacrifice Christian kids. The blood libels were a real thing. They're a historical event. Were they happening in 1580? Ugh. But I digress. The Jews in the story are straight up not having a good time. On the next page, we meet the major player for the Gollum story, Rabbi Lowe. Rabbi Lowe is a real dude who was the chief rabbi of Prague around this time. In the book, he knows that bad vibes are on the horizon for the Jews, and he's not sure what to do about it. Then he falls asleep and has a vision of a divinely written word, Gollum, Gimel, Lamed, Mem. He already knows what a Gollum is because he's a rabbi and they're supposed to know such things. Gollum was a giant of living clay, animated by Kabbalah, mystical teachings of untold power. Kabbalah is Jewish mysticism. You might have heard about celebrities doing Kabbalah stuff. It's got a, a weird place in the current day. Honestly, it was weird back then, too. You just heard me say, man of living clay. Things are a little kooky. Personally, I'd like to think that Madonna started to do Kabbalah specifically because of how into the golem she was, but that's probably optimistic. Anyway, Rabbi Lowe realizes that this drastic step, creating a golem, is necessary. And so he and some helpers go to the banks of a river under the cover of night. They get a bunch of clay, and he shapes it into a giant, man-shaped lump. And then, as you can see from the illustration, stuff gets wild. Rabbi Lowe essentially animates his clay, brings it to life-ish. 
The story mentioned earlier, this is like a high-level technique. Most people can't bring clay to life, but Rabbi Lowe is a level 100 boss, so he does it without too much trouble. The lightning subsides, and whammo, there's the golem, complete and perfect in the words of the book. He's a big old dude. An important part of the story happens here. The thing that actually wakes the golem is the rabbi carving the word emet in his forehead, Aleph Mem Tav, which means truth. Then the golem wakes up. An unusual twist for this story, the one Wisniewski has written, is that the golem speaks. Almost always it's a mute giant, but in this one he says, Father, was this wise to do? Which were incidentally also my first words. The rabbi is like, we'll find out, and they give him something to wear, and everyone heads back to chill at the synagogue. They get back, and the rabbi is like, here's the deal. You're here to protect the Jews. And the ways you're gonna do that is to catch the people doing the blood libel. This has always struck me as one of the most unusual parts of the story, because the golem is basically tasked to be a detective? Like he's big, and usually not written to be a genius, but he's not killing anyone. He's not a violent vigilante. He's actually just really good at solving the blood libels. The rabbi wants him to go and find the actual culprit whenever someone says that Jews have sacrificed someone. And he's good at it. He tracks those murderers down and, and turns them in to be arrested? I'm just saying, gumshoe golem, private clay eye. Three ideas here. So the golem does detective work and he also just helps out around the ghetto. I picture him like sweeping and carrying big piles of books and stuff. The Wisniewski story gives him a real childlike innocence. He stops to watch the sunrise, gets distracted by birds, etc. This isn't present in every golem story, but I really like it. It kind of gives him an iron giant vibe. Honestly, the iron giant has a real golem vibe but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The Gollum is so good at his detective work that the enemies of the Jews get enraged because every day people are learning that Jews actually don't use their blood to make matzah. These are just murders being pinned on an undeserving group of people. And those enemies of the Jews get so mad that they riot and start rushing the ghetto. Rabbi Lowe tells the Gollum to come help protect the Jews, and another interesting twist Wisniewski throws in here is the Gollum seems to be getting taller, getting bigger. The Gollum goes to the gates of the ghetto and holds them for as long as he can, but the mob eventually breaks them down using a battering ram. They start rushing into the Jewish quarter, and that's when the Gollum really goes sicko mode, starts sweeping aside people, breaks the battering ram in half, really becomes a violent protector rather than the quiet detective he had been before. Rabbi Lowe is distraught. He didn't want this kind of violence. Eventually, the rioters run away, the golem puts the gate back on its hinges, and they head back to the synagogue. The next day, Rabbi Lowe goes to the emperor. The emperor is like, okay, are you gonna kill us all with your giant clay man? And the rabbi is like, no, he's just for protection. We just want to be safe. The emperor then says that he'll guarantee the safety of your people. This is actually pretty similar to the Purim story, if anyone's familiar, where a non-Jewish monarch is like, I, I guess we'll protect you under the rule of law now. Rabbi Lowe says, great, I'll deactivate the golem, but just so you know, if things get bad again, he'll come back and he'll be even stronger. We return to the Jewish quarter and the Gollum actually knows what's about to happen and is pretty distraught about it. He says, Father, will I remember this? This is also unusual among versions of the story. The Gollum's agency isn't usually so highlighted. Rabbi Lowe says, no, you will be clay. And then, the piece de resistance, the cherry on top of the whole Gollum story, the rabbi reaches out and erases the Aleph from the Gollum's head so it doesn't read emet or truth anymore, it reads met, death. At the end of the story, 
Rabbi Lowe and his helpers place Gollum in the attic of the synagogue and cover him in books. Though Gollum had not truly been a man, they recited Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. Then they left, locking the door behind them forever. Since then, Gollum has slept the dreamless sleep of clay, but many say he could awaken, perhaps when the desperate need for justice is united with holy purpose. Gollum will come to life once more. That concludes our story time. Now, I think we have some birthdays today. Ari, Miriam, come and get your Tootsie Pops. Yom Haled It Tzameach. Yom Haled It Tzameach. Prague in 1580 is the story in which the Gollum rises to cultural prominence, but it's not the first incidence of the concept. That would be actually Adam, like the first guy Adam. There are lines in the book of Psalms that refer to Adam as an undeveloped substance, kind of like clay. And there's also this notion of the body without a soul. That is, when Adam was just a body created by God, he was without any kind of interiority. He was a golem. This is a really important through line in talking about these myths because it underscores what the golem represents. It is a creation of life, creating a living object in one's own image, which is, you know, what God does. This is a myth that kind of blurs the line between human and divine creation. And I think it's why so many of these stories underscore the golem as being imperfect. You don't want to get too close. By the way, virtually all of this is coming from this book, The Gollum Redux by Elizabeth Baer. It's very good, and you should check it out. As time goes on, more scholars write about this topic, and even this is really muddled in terms of how literally any of it was supposed to be taken. The story of religion. For instance, there's this book, The Sefer Yetzira, The Book of Creation, that was maybe written as just a speculative work, but was then referred to as literal instructions on how to make life. One of my favorite aspects of the story is how language ties into the process. We got a little of that with the Emmet to Met, life to death thing of the Wisniewski story, but this is actually even more important in other versions. There's this concept of the true name of God, that it's really powerful and unknowable. But back in the day, some rabbis would know some of it, or all of it, and they would put that name in the golem's mouth, and that's what would bring it to life. When talking about this thing, it's easy to get bogged down in rules. What kind of writing goes on the golem? Who can make it? What does it require? But I think the minutia moves us away from what makes it interesting. Why is this a story that exists and has persisted? Let's get back to Prague. So, here's the thing. 1580 may have been the time the story was set, but that's not actually when people started talking about it. Jews in 16th century Prague weren't like, wow, crazy that a rabbi has a clay man walking around, right? It actually wasn't until the 1840s that stories were written linking Rabbi Lowe and the Prague synagogue with the Gollum, and not until 1909 that the canonical Gollum story we know today emerged. The book was called The Wondrous Deeds of the Maharal of Prague with the Gollum, written by a guy named Eudel Rosenberg. That's more than 300 years removed from the time period he was writing about. What was the motivation? Well, here's one. I mentioned during story time that the idea of blood libels happening under Rabbi Lowe's watch during the 1580s was a little shaky. There actually isn't any evidence of those types of crimes during that time span. The 1500s were almost a golden period for Jews in Prague. In the 1300s, there were riots in which the Jewish quarter was burned and looted, and thousands of Jews were killed. Jews were actually made to wear yellow badges. Compared to that, the 1500s were pretty chill. But here's the thing, starting just a couple decades before Rosenberg published his book in 1909, Accusations of blood libel started happening again. Huge, well-publicized trials in which state governments prosecuted Jews on basically the claims that they used Christian blood in rituals all across Europe. 
And so you can see why this particular story might resonate, a resurfaced myth made directly relevant to the plight that people were facing at that particular time. For Jews, the idea that we've been through something like this before, we survived, is a pretty dang powerful one. Is it any wonder that the story of a golem, a larger-than-life figure that protected Jews from angry mobs and false accusations, would provide a little comfort? But that's just one version, just Udall writing his little story at the turn of the century. That's just the start of all the places this story would go. Given that the Gollum story really only emerged in full in 1909, it's fairly remarkable how quickly adaptations of it, including adaptations by non-Jews, sprung forth. One of the most prominent of these was a German silent film called Der Gollum, Wie er in die Welt kam. or The Gollum, How He Came Into This World. This rather protracted title is because this movie was actually a prequel to a 1915 German silent horror movie just called The Gollum. Presumably German audiences were like, how did he come into this world in the same way? Or like, why is he named Han Solo? There's even another silent movie in this period called The Gollum and the Dancing Girl, which your guess is as good as mine, but both of those were destroyed, and how he came into this world was the one we got. So let's talk about it. Der Gollum was directed by Paul Wegner and fits squarely into the German expressionist period of silent film, along with other films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which came out in the same year. I'll be honest, I don't like this movie. It is tremendously slow, and many of the main characters are just kind of grotesque, and I think that's probably the point, but it's just not quite for me. Paul Wegner himself plays the Gollum, and certainly forms a striking silhouette, but he's also very much a movie monster, and honestly also way too close to minstrelry for me to feel comfortable. The rabbi in the story basically borrows the power of a demon to bring him to life, and he's just kind of a dumb brute, and at the end he throws a guy off a roof. I don't think the movie is specifically anti-Semitic, but I would also not say it's particularly flattering to Jews, and this was made in Germany in 1920, so that fact is kind of hard to ignore. However, the one place that I can praise this movie without reservation is the set design done by a German architect named Hans Polzig. It is truly remarkable. A massive and three-dimensional version of the ghetto that's bending in on itself, almost like the Jewish quarter is buckling under the weight of oppression. I mean, look at this thing. Tim Burton, eat your heart out. It is the one part of the movie that gives me the same feeling as my favorite expressionist art. There's so much to like here. The way the fire consumes a room, the lighting in a basement, the truly unbelievable density of the crowd scenes. Polzig's other major architectural contribution was a theater in Berlin called the Grosses Schauspielhaus, and I bring this up just to say, look at it. I have genuinely never seen a built space that looks like this. Towards the end of his career, Polzig made plans to flee Germany. The Nazis called his expressionist theater degenerate art and covered the ceiling. They accused Polzig of cultural Bolshevism. He died in 1936. Where were we? I don't think it's an accident that the visual representations of the Gollum are so enduring. The Gollum itself is a sculpted object, a man made out of clay. And as such, the story seems to pull incredible visual representations out of people. There are Polzig's sets, Wisniewski's cut paper illustrations, clay models, just like this one. Another version of the story with a beautiful visual language is The Gollum by Elie Wiesel, illustrated by Mark Podwall. In Podwall's art, the Hebrew alphabet rises out of the streets and objects of Prague. The resonance with the story is clear, just as the Gollum is animated by the powerful words of Rabbi Lowe, so too does the entire Jewish quarter exist because of the power of language. 
Judaism is a culture built on study, examination, argument. The Gala may be the most literal manifestation of the power of those words, but Potwell's illustrations imply that everything built is, in some way, fueled by the same power. Wiesel's story is kind of a meta-meditation itself, told generations removed from the actual events. It begins, I owe this legend to an old beggar named Schmeike. He would tell only one story, always the same story, which he allegedly inherited from his uncle. This uncle had been told the story by his maternal grandfather, Rabbi Issachar, who had attributed it to his master, the famous Rabbi Ephraim. Rabbi Ephraim had heard the tale from a gravedigger, Reuven, son of Yaakov, who claimed to have witnessed the numerous miracles that legend attributes to the Golem. Right off the bat, we're presented with the story as completely distant from its point of origin, passed through the years, as Jewish stories are. The anachronisms, like the blood libel, make complete sense in Wiesel's telling. Of course, somewhere along the chain, someone would have modified the story to coincide with whatever the Jews were currently up against. It also makes certain lines in this version all the more wrenching. If you know who Wiesel is, you probably have some idea, but we're not quite there yet. Other interpretations of the Gollum are quite infatuated with this idea of language. Possibly greatest living sci-fi author Ted Chang has a short story called 72 Letters that dives into an immensely complex uh, Gollum industrial world in which Gollums are animated to do all sorts of things by different permutations of commands given to them using an almost scientific formula derived from an object's true name. Chang casually drops lines like, Current thinking held that there was a lexical universe as well as a physical one, and bringing an object together with a compatible name caused latent potentialities. And it's all very heady stuff, but ultimately it centers on, again, the power of language. The story ends with the epiphany that language imprints on us as much as on any golem, that it is in fact necessary for our own reproduction. Although scientific when compared to Wiesel's traditional, the theme of words carrying through time remains the same. Finally, honorary king of this channel, Jorge Luis Borges, has a poem called El Golem, in which he too ponders this power. He starts the poem by ruminating on the power of names and humanity's vain quest to understand the power that lies within them. In the poem, Rabbi Lowe, shuffling letters endlessly, stumbles upon the one true name, speaks it, and animates the golem. But the golem is imperfect, flawed, tragic, and Lowe is overcome with guilt. Ultimately, Borges draws the final connection between the failure of Lowe and that of God. Also, this poem was originally in Spanish. So this translation, like the Gollum, is imperfect. The rabbi observed it with tenderness and with some horror. How, he asked, could I beget this sorry son and abandon inaction where insanity lies? Why did I add to the infinite series another symbol? Why to the vain skein that winds in the eternal did I give another cause, another effect, and grief? In the hour of anguish and lack of light, his eyes on his golem would rest. Who will tell us the things God felt when looking at his rabbi in Prague? In 1938, two Jewish kids from Cleveland created a nigh-invincible protector, quite literally put words in his mouth, and sent him out into the world. They called him Call El, or Superman. It's pretty clever, huh? It's kind of remarkable how much of superheroes as we know them were created by Jewish artists. Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster create Superman, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, Bill Finger and Bob Kane, Will Eisner, Gene Colan, would you like me to keep going? There is the simple statement that these were Jewish American artists creating heroes to beat the shit out of Nazis. Which is true. But I can't ignore the fact that so many characters, especially the incredibly strong, nigh-invincible ones, feel so Gollum-esque. I mean, Superman exists as a protector. He doesn't have truth written on his forehead, but he might as well. 
There have been more literal examples. There was a short-lived character called the Gollum that was more or less the myth we know, but purple. There are a couple higher brow graphic novels, Cavalier and Clay and The Gollum's Mighty Swing, that are very explicitly Jewish and dissecting the Gollum's legacy. There's our old friend Ben Grimm, aka The Thing, who's extremely Jewish, like the most Jewish, and buddy, he's a big thing made of rocks that clobbers people. That's the Gollum. It kind of amazes me just how clear the allegory is. No, these figures are not sculpted from clay, and yes, they can speak and stuff, but you have these strong, benevolent creatures, fictional but often fighting real oppression, brought to life with art and animated with the power of language. I mean, come on. Also, you know, like this scene in every comic book? Here's a scene from Der Gollum in 1920. He's been superheroing for a while. Gollums in our current world are everywhere. Der den man Bären Jude nennt, soll ein Golem sein. Ich glaube wirklich, dass der Bären Jude ein Golem ist. Und wenn doch. I'm not going to be able to hit everyone, but to name a few. There's an X-Files episode called Kaddish that handles the Gollum shockingly well. Although there's a twist that the animated figure is sort of reanimated. He's taken the form of a woman's fiance who was killed. Three letters. Aleph, Mem, Tuff. Creates the word Emmet. It's fashioned from mud and then animated through mystical incantation. Mud? The myth is told quite accurately and handled with respect. The Gollum goes around and kills a bunch of Nazis, Praxis, but ultimately the story is about the lingering trauma of the Holocaust, and how that loss can leave a person, or even a community, feeling like it's lost its soul. It's a really good episode of The X-Files. Also, Scully doesn't even get to provide an alternate explanation in this. You know how in every episode she's like, that wasn't aliens, it was just swamp gas, or whatever. She doesn't do that here. I guess she just believes in golems. Frankenstein is a pretty obvious analog. There's some circumstantial evidence that Mary Shelley came into contact with a golem myth before writing her book, and at one point she refers to the monster being sculpted from lifeless clay. But I would say the closer parallel would be their filmic adaptations. The silhouette of Wegener in Der Gollum is immensely Frankenstein-esque, and both have fairly iconic scenes with little girls. And then, moving into the fantasy world, Gollum has really just come to mean a robot in a non-sci-fi environment. Final Fantasy is full of Gollum's Dark Souls, Minecraft, Pokemon has a Gollum. Gollum. Ghastly, horsey, I don't think that one really counts. In video games, it's hard to escape the enormous shadow of the Colossus a game that is packed to the brim with creatures made of stone and earth, brought to life through magic, protecting a land from a violent invader. There are also many versions of the Gollum story, or Gollums in other media, that lose control at some point, go kind of wild, and have to be brought down. I have to say, I don't really love this beat. I mean, I get it. A point about the hubris of people to think they could create life like a god, but it really gets away from the story's original themes of protection. The one exception to this is something like the Iron Giant, as I mentioned earlier. The idea of a being capable of great violence, yet choosing to be gentle and a shield instead. That's the good stuff right there. Listen, I'm not saying this was intentional, but if you view the Iron Giant like a Gollum story, oh boy, it works. The Gollum has been appropriated into basically every corner of culture at this point, and I don't use that word judgmentally. I don't feel that the original story of the Gollum is lessened because it's also a Dark Souls boss. There are, I'm sure, other Jews that feel differently. We're not a monolith. In fact, we're probably best at arguing with each other. I've done a lot of talking about a mythical creature in this video. And on one hand, maybe that's enough. 
It's fun to track influences through history, see the origins of our cultural tropes. But I don't know, I feel like there's more to this story than that, more to my fascination, more to this idea that's permeated through history. I mean, actually, I know what it is. I mentioned Elie Wiesel's version of the Gollum story a while ago, one that I like very much. But there's another layer to his telling, because Elie Wiesel, you might know, was an immensely talented and prolific Jewish writer, and he was also a Holocaust survivor. You might have read his book Night in school, maybe. And that history makes Wiesel's telling of the Gollum story hit harder than virtually any other that I've read. This is true of all of Wiesel's writing. There are lines in this story that are simple, and yet just tear me apart. There's one where he says, father was always happy, or at least he seemed to be. I really loved my father. And that's, I mean, that's, that's nothing. That's just a line about a family. But if you've read Knight or know Wiesel's history, you know how he was orphaned while in the death camps. And it's just... My point is that Wiesel's writing, explicitly or not, like so much of the Jewish art of the last 70 years, is unavoidably post-Holocaust. It's inescapable. And you don't have to stretch to find Wiesel's reflection on the Holocaust and the Gollum story. He puts them in the first chapter, and he manages to sum up my own thoughts while writing these thousands of words better than I ever could. And we miss him, the Gollum. More than ever, we need his presence, and perhaps even his mystery. As usual, the year promises to be one of punishment. I feel it in every bone of my body. I have lived through too many ordeals not to be able to predict what the future has in store. Oh, of course I have faith in God. I would not be a Jew if I did not have faith, but neither would I be a Jew if I were not afraid. I know that sometimes there are men who choose death because they wish to escape this wretched earth which first bears us and then devours us. Ah, if only the Gollum were still among us, I would sleep more peacefully. Why did the Maharal take him from us? Did he really believe that the era of suffering and injustice was a thing of the past? Tell that we no longer needed a protector? A shield? Tell me, please, our Maharal who knew everything, did he not know that exile after him would become harder than before, even more cruel, that the burden would become heavier, more bloody? He could have left us his golem. He should have. What did he fear? And what can we say to that? What purpose does the Gollum story serve to Ezel or the millions of others that lived through reality too hellish to imagine, the Jews and non-Jews who continue to live in that reality to this day? And yet, it's Ezel who wrote the book. He is the one continuing the legacy of the Gollum, so clearly it serves some purpose to him, right? The Gollum is a story about many things, but at its most basic, it is a story about creating something, creating art, and then that art going on to protect you. It is a created object that was built to preserve the Jewish people. And in that way, the hundreds of stories about different Gollums aren't simply retellings of the original, a concept that barely exists. Instead, they are their own sculptures, continuing that legacy. Each one of them is a form of remembrance and renewal and preservation. They are golems in themselves. Art is not the only form of protection we need in the modern world. There is not a clay figure that will stride in to stop injustice, to protect refugees, to prevent state oppression. That's us. We gotta do that now. The golem has always been an imperfect creation that's baked into its existence. It isn't a replacement for, for, you know, us. But the continued existence of art, of stories, is the continued existence of a people. Elie Wiesel continues to tell the story of the Gollum because the Nazis were unable to take that from him, and I am telling it to you now. And presumably, some of you will go home and say, hey, did you know the Gollum is a Jewish thing? So it is a form of protection. Quiet, maybe, but the Gollum has never been a noisy figure. And it's our words, not its, that keep it alive.
This video was sponsored by Skillshare. You have probably heard of Skillshare and the thousands of classes they offer on all sorts of subjects. And often I and other YouTubers will <laughs> pitch some classes that we've used to make ourselves better at technical skills, how to handle cameras or edit or something. That's not what I want to do for you today. Look, listen to me, pick up some clay. There's a woman named Stephanie Kilgast on Skillshare that has videos for every level of artist, from the simple to the, dang, I better organize a bug-themed party so I can show everyone else up. This is from her class, How to Sculpt Moths and Butterflies from Polymer Clay, by the way. Art is like any other skill. You don't get better at it by thinking really hard. You get better with practice and help. Skillshare is perfect for that. No pressure practice with a really helpful teacher and as you might have guessed, the first thousand people that follow the link in the description get a free trial of Skillshare Premium, and it's only 10 bucks a month after that with an annual plan. Make some bugs, or a little succulent garden, or come on, make a golem. Just a little dude, you already know what to write on its forehead. Learning a new skill doesn't have to make you better or more efficient at your job. It can just be that little extra push to starting a hobby you've always been curious about, or one that you've recently discovered and want to leg up on. So, like I said, use the link in the description. Get a free Skillshare trial. Pick up some clay. Breathe some life into your art. And then show it to me. Because I would love to see it.